with that church. Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning praying that you once again bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our collective hearts as we come to you this blessed morning, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. If you notice, friends, during this season, we talked about the fact that Mark would be our guide this year, our main leader through the wilderness. And we've got a couple more weeks that we're going to have John as our guide. And we'll come back to Mark for our unique service of broadcast church and the parade through Hyattstown. But as we follow the lectionary over the next three or so weeks, we're going to explore some of the stories, the unique stories through the Gospel of John and his perspectives. For those that you, of you that remember and for those of you that are new or have forgotten, I went to Wake Forest Divinity School and my beloved professor, or she became that way, she didn't start out that way, she is or was one of the smartest, most intellectual people that I have ever met and she was rather intimidating, at least to me. Um, she is also one of the most prolific writers on the Gospel of John. So I always feel a certain mix of honor and dread when I preach on this Gospel. She passed away on September 22nd of 2018, and at that time I was finishing or working on my second residency in chaplaincy, and I was able um, at her husband Tom's behest to spend some of her last days with her. Um, she was ravaged by a brain tumor. And for those of you that have ever spent time with someone with a brain tumor, particularly someone as intellectual as Gail O'Day, it was both beautiful and tragic to spend that time with her. But what a beautiful mind she had. And we are so blessed that her work lives on, particularly in the volumes of commentaries and books she wrote on the Gospel of John. I miss her, but find great solace in the conversation partner that she has become for me in this work. Though this isn't part of either scripture or my sermon today, it's worth noting that John's story of the passion is the only one that doesn't include a Last Supper. And can anyone point to why this is? I know you're going to have to unmute yourself if you know why. I'm going to say Bueller. Was it the timelines of the um, when the Last Supper was? Nope. Okay. I'm going to give you one more chance before I, I'm going to Alex Trebek y'all. Who is the Last Supper? in John. It's metaphorical. Jesus is the lamb in the book of John, right? Jesus is the lamb of God. So the reason that there is no last supper, well, one, it is sort of the timeline that they flip, but that's not why, Miranda. Um, they have the last supper the, in the beginning of John, but the reason that they flip it is because Jesus becomes the ultimate sacrifice, the lamb of God in the book of John. So the lamb or the Passover meal in John's gospel is Jesus for 200 or whatever. So that's what that's one thing that makes the book of John particularly unique. There are a whole bunch of other things, but Passover is near in this particular story. This is the Jewish festival of deliverance from bondage. And at the same time, deliverance into what? This intimate, as we've talked about John, this intimate obedience to God represented by the Ten Commandments. And there are three Passover festivals in John. The last one coinciding with, like I just said, Jesus's crucifixion. So this, this happens with his public ministry beginning approximately two years prior to his death. And Jesus's first sign was at the wedding of Cana. And this has just happened. 
though only his disciples, his mother, and a few servants are aware of this. And I had the wine in Cana, and it is awful, let me tell y'all. It was, it, it's awful wine. Though it was a miracle that it happened, the wine in Cana is awful, and people get it and bring it home, and I don't know, maybe if they have wine in Missouri, comparatively, it's good wine, but the wine in Cana is awful, y'all. So, and so now Jesus really goes public with the story that was read today by Miranda. And I loved your reading. It was very theatrical. Gail, were you proud of her reading? She was very like, she was big in her reading, right? Big thumbs up because this was a theatrical thing that he did there, right? And we're going to get to why it was so theatrical in a minute. Okay. So he goes public in this big, bold way. So I am, I am just loving your reading of it because this was no small jesus didn't go over and kind of flip some tables like just lightly flip some tables this was a big bold jesus move right it was the most dramatic prestigious jewish space of all the temple in jerusalem at the most prestigious time right days before passover so for him to walk in there and do this at this time was bold. John's gospel is perhaps the most critical of empire, right? Or state. And this vignette is no different. Okay. In ancient times, much of business was done at um, or exchanged in temple spaces and not just Jewish temples, right? So, but this is our context. We're not going to go in to talk about like pagan spaces or other Hellenistic and Greek times but this is our context so this wasn't unique to jews or hebrew um, israelites um in all of the roman empires this was happening okay no weapons are allowed in the temple so i don't know i came from north carolina where you could conceal and carry all over the place um, with my little stint in iowa too but churches all over except for a few which would allow you to brandish your weapon um, well, they were even open carry, but churches would have these signs on them. And, and this was really typical in temples too, but it was, it was in, it wasn't a sign on the door because temples weren't like that. Okay. So no weapons were allowed in the temple. So Jesus did what he improvises a whip out of cords. And this would have been a cord, like hanging on, I don't know, like our, um, our, our vestments, right? This would have been those kind of cords. So he kind of makes his own whip out of these things that would have been hanging for um, in the temple space. And he um, drives out these merchants and animals and money changers, turns over their tables with righteous indignation. And Miranda got really big and bold when this was happening. Stop making God's house a marketplace. Right, this was not a small statement. He got big and bold and he was not a very tall person historically. Side note, and this was when I told you about um, the law in North Carolina. So this is interesting per the religious law in ancient times. So we can kind of carry these two together, right? Not so much has changed regarding that in spaces of religious context comparatively. So the temple sacrificial system depended on that marketplace to supply both animals suitable for sacrifice, cattle, sheep, doves, not pigs, because that would have been disallowed, and the special coins permitted in the temple. To do away with this market system then was to strike at the sacrificial system itself that existed since Abraham and Sarah, right? In the background here is this ancient prophet, Zechariah, which we saw when, right, in the transfiguration. And the same visionary whose words will be enacted on Palm Sunday, right? Lo, your king comes to you humbly and riding what? A donkey, right? And Zechariah also speaks of the new age to come when the holiness associated with the temple will pervade the whole world, right? And says what? There will be no longer traitors in the house of the Lord. Okay, so this idea seems to be that traitors are a part of a layer of separation between God and Israel. Okay, so we want John wants to remove that layer, right, to make intimate God and humanity. 
So what's happened since the Imago Day, where God said, you are made in God's image and the temple spaces is now there needs to be someone between to intercede. And what the book of John, what Jesus is saying in the book of John is there needs to be no one interceding. There needs to be no sacrifice, no exchange, no capital exchange in between God and humanity. So it's taking out that middle person, okay? Thus, Jesus driving out traitors of the temple, like his eventual arrival, and for us, it's going to be, you know, three, three weeks, right? We're going to just go there, you know? On a donkey is kind of street theater, declaring through action that we are intimately connected to the eternal being of God and Jesus, right? So it's this beautiful evolution. Okay. So what does this mean for temple authorities? What does this mean? Okay. The religious authorities demand a sign from Jesus that would justify his authority. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, what, what would we do? I don't know. It'd be strange, right? In veiled and resonant, bold language, Jesus proposes a sign that the authorities then mistakenly take at face value. As, as everyone typically does. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They think he's referring to what? Brick and mortar, right? Temple structure, right? Physical structure. They think he's referring to that. But in fact, John explains this. He's speaking of what? The temple of his body. Jesus is the human divine embodiment. And we get to that in the resurrection, right? So Jesus does three things at once. And I want to talk about this a little bit. He opposes and what? He aggravates those religious authorities. He makes them angry and potentially pushes his own death to come faster. He cryptically predicts his what? Death and resurrection. But, but he knows that's coming anyway. So, I mean, we, we know the ending. Right, something disciples realize only later after he was raised from the dead. Right, he casts a revolutionary what vision for worship in the new era. His body is the temple. And as much as I want to, I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm going to go off script for a little bit. Um, I've talked to you all about my friend Amy. She she laughs, you know, we can take communion. I'm going to do a Ritz cracker today that I probably can't even eat. Um, but she laughs because they, she is so Catholic. She is so absolutely Catholic. They absolutely believe that um, the transfiguration, that their, their bread and wine has been truly made into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, right? So she has this, and if I had this story in my um, lineage, I probably might believe it as well. So she has this great, great uncle, which would be probably the age of my grandfather because um, he served in the Korean War. And her great uncle served in the Korean War as well. He was a chaplain in the Korean War. And in the Korean War, there was a fire in one of their um, chapel spaces. Now, I'm assuming that this chapel space was some sort of tent space because you know, you didn't have permanent structures in war time. Um, but the chapel had um, caught fire while um, they were worship, while folks were worshiping. And the other chaplain was in this tent um, worshiping with some folks. And they had gotten everyone out of the tent, um, all the people. But what they hadn't gotten out of the tent was what? The body and blood of Christ. And they were sitting on the altar. So uncle great uncle and the other chaplain went back in to what save the body and blood of christ because they believed they were really saving jesus christ because jesus was in there and the two men that went back in suffered third degree burns all over their entire bodies and um both of them died both of them died saving jesus christ right so this is a story that has been told in a, they're proud of this story. They're so, so very proud of this story because they saved. And then the folks that were saved from um, this 
horrible fire, these military men, and I don't know, there were probably some women there, nurses or some sort of other things. I don't know how that worked in the Korean War. Um, they ended up taking communion from that bread that was saved from that fire. So they, they believe that they saved that embodiment of Jesus Christ. So coming off of this, you know, after he was raised and resurrected, they took this, um, and this, the third thing is it casts a revolutionary vision for worship in the new era. His body is the temple. And that is how the Catholics get to this, right? That is how we get to this Eucharistic practice. Now, I don't know if I'm going to run in, if our church goes on fire, I'm going to try to save all y'all, but I don't know that I'm going to go save our Ritz crackers and our Manischewitz, you know, I don't, I don't know, but I'm going to try to save all y'all. And I might try to save a few other things that are but that's some revolutionary love right there. That's, you know, those folks really believe that. So this is how this revolutionary thing that Jesus does in this moment, this is how the temple space becomes a world religion, right? The temple is ultimately destroyed. It's rebuilt too. I think they're on the second or third rebuild of that temple in Israel. But this is how Christianity or Judaism become you know, worshiped around the world. Otherwise that same temple, it would only be in that temple of 70 AD. We would not be worshiping in Hyattstown. My grandmother wouldn't have worshiped in First Baptist in Fremont, Nebraska. Um, Coptic Christians um, in Egypt would not be Coptic Christians in Egypt. So what Jesus does in this moment is to tell folks that it's not the building, y'all. It's, it's not the temple. It's, it's the body, it's my body, it's the human divine. So perhaps by recognizing the audacious claim embedded in his actions, the authorities demand the sign, what, it, what does that mean? You know, what, it, what does that mean? And in other words, for John, Jesus' arrival signals this new age, right? A new intimacy with God not built in a temple. And I'm going to say some things in a moment that are going to make you uncomfortable. So just prepare yourselves for that. Not as a building, but as a person built in spirit and truth, right? Jesus himself, God's word made flesh that was there from the beginning and is going to be there long after insurrections, long after temples, long after, right? Driving out traitors. Zechariah's vision made whole fashioning whips out of fabric, right? Let these thousands of doves arise and scatter. We don't need sacrifices anymore, right? And it's worth remembering that the gospel of John was written after Roman armies had destroyed the first Jerusalem temple, a period when both Jews and early Christians were struggling to make sense of this, right? A world without what they had considered the sacred axis, right? And rabbinic Judaism eventually refigured the temple, the home, and early Christians refigured the temple as the body of Jesus, which is also the body of the church and the body, as John put it, the logos, the word made flesh, the pattern underlying the cosmic temple of creation. As Peter put it, the rock, right? The church, but it was still, for Peter, the church was still a building, right? And why is Jesus so angry? It's the ancient anger of prophets, the sacred zeal. Miranda got it. She got angry in that moment, right? That moves against and beyond the sacrifice of animals, of creation. We talked about this a little bit in our group this week. You know, when John says, for God so loved the world. God loves everything, all of creation unbound by a particular building or system or exchange where we trade this for that and something has to die for us to be made whole, Jesus is angry at that system. And it's an ancient passion too for a coming of God's jubilee, a new Passover, a new exodus from all bondage, a new freedom to abide in God as God abides in us. There's no trade-off. God doesn't need us to give up who we are to be made whole, right? 
There's this verse in Micah contrasting justice and kindness and humility to animal sacrifices. In his own way, Jesus picks up this prophetic mantle and fashions his whip out of these cords. In brief, he's angry about any system or structure that creates an apparent barrier between God and God's people. At its heart, his mission is about dismantling barriers, exposing them as illusionary or elusive. In that sense, his mission is about reconciliation, mutual indwelling, abide in me as I abide in you from John 15. And the just, kind, humble life flows from such intimacy. Okay, so here's that part that'll make us shift. So there's this Orthodox theologian, Alexander Schmemann, which I'm assuming he's Jewish or German. He warned that the quickest way to desecrate a landscape was to build a church. Since a supposed holy ground would instantly imply that everything outside of its doors was profane. And sure enough, the word profane comes from the Latin word for outside the temple. Like the prophets before him, Jesus can be understood in this week's passage as challenging our tendency to domesticate God into the temple or the church. Whoever did that thing when we were kids, right? Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Here are the people. When we go to church, we don't step into God's presence, right? We step into a community, right? That at its best, can help call our attention to the fact that God is present where? Everywhere. That the body of Jesus and the movement of the spirit is boundless. And so that all the temple's architecture must extend all the way out, all the way to the expounding edges of the cosmos. And I love our little historic church. And that's why our vision is important, right? that it doesn't keep people out. Wendell Berry, our beloved poet laureate, says the opposite. There is no sacred space or profane space, only sacred and desecrated. So it is how and what we do, right? It's not that our building is more sacred than the land behind it, or deep breath, the people that walk through our doors, or the folks that we feed in Frederick. The building is here for what purpose? I would argue the same purpose that we are, right? To serve and be the hands and feet of Christ. The basic idea isn't unique to Jesus. Rather, he stands on a unique lineage that we can find in the prophets and in Exodus. At Sinai, God could have given the Israelites a temple and a fortress. But instead, he sent them in the wilderness and gave them a law and a code that would saturate their lives as they wandered, investing virtually every moment with the possibility of holiness and beauty, dignity and devotion. At its best, a law is a pathway for living, an immersive form of listening to a call. It's a way of abiding with and in one another in intimate companionship, doing the right thing, yes, but also living the right way with one another, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with your God. Any barrier to that abundant life, to that joy and gladness, well, it makes Jesus angry and bold enough to make whips from cords. And friends, that's what our mission needs to be. That's how we find that ministry that pulls at our heartstrings, that tugs at us to be in community with one another. Thanks, Miranda, for that wonderful and bold reading of Jesus' theater. Amen.